Hello, I'm Carrie Garrison Laney. I'm a coastal hazards expert with Washington Sea Grant, and I'm going to kick off the webinar today by talking about tsunami sources in Washington State and some of the geologic evidence for past tsunami events. In Washington, we know we have several different tsunami sources. These include tsunamis generated by Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes, tsunamis that form on, after earthquakes on crustal faults. An example of this is the Seattle Fault. Tsunamis formed by landslides, either into or underwater. And these landslides can either be triggered by earthquakes or just happen without earthquakes. And we also know that we can get distant source tsunamis. And an example of this is the 1964 Alaska earthquake tsunami, which made it all the way um, down the west coast of the U.S. and caused damage in many locations. I'm going to start off by showing this animation of how tsunamis form. And here we see an earthquake causing deformation on the ocean floor, lifting up part of the seabed, and that displaces all of the overlying water and generates a wave that moves out in all directions. In deep water, the wave moves very quickly and has a lower wave height. But as it gets to shallower water, the frictional forces at the floor of the ocean start to act on the water and cause the wave height to increase and the speed slow down. And as the trough hits the shore, this causes a big drawdown of ocean level and the, the coastline appears to recede out that's an indication that a tsunami is on the way, as well as the earthquake itself. As the tsunami approaches, you really get an idea of what a relentless force this is. The entire water column rushes onto land, very different from normal wind-generated waves and waves can keep coming for many hours after the event. Now I'm going to talk about the seismic sources for tsunamis in Washington. In this picture, we are looking at a cross section through Washington to show all three sources of uh, potential tsunami sources. So uh, we've got subduction zone earthquakes here. Shallow earthquakes are depicted here. These are on faults in the North America plate. And also earthquakes that form deep underground in the subducting Juan de Fuca plate. And I'll talk about each one of these in some detail now. First, I'll talk about Cascadia. So Cascadia earthquakes are earthquakes that occur at the interface between the subducting oceanic crust of the Juan de Fuca plate and the overlying continental crust of the North America plate. So these earthquakes are generated at uh, where these two plates are in contact. And we know that in the next 50 years, there's about a 10 to 14 percent chance of a magnitude 9 great earthquake and about a 30% chance of a magnitude 8 earthquake. And these earthquakes, magnitude 9 earthquakes, recur uh, about every 430 years for the southern part of the Washington coastline to about every 500 years for the northern part. And these numbers vary because uh, we believe that there, there are more earthquakes in the southern part of Cascadia than in the northern part. So as you mo move north, there are fewer earthquake events, and that affects the recurrence. And well, what is recurrence? Actually, recurrence is just dividing the amount of time by the number of earthquakes. It just gives you an average idea about how often these things reoccur, but it doesn't tell you exactly how long it is between each earthquake. This map is showing the 20 largest earthquake locations for the last 100 years or so. And it includes 
the top four largest ever known earthquakes um, for the last hundred years that have been measured. Uh, the, the largest one was in 1960, magnitude 9.5 in Chile. Second largest in 1964, magnitude 9.2 in Alaska. And then the 2004 and 2011 uh, earthquakes, which were both about magnitude 9.1. And you'll notice that the Cascadia subduction zone does not have an earthquake plotted. And that's because Cascadia has not experienced a great earthquake since the year 1700. Now, in the animation I showed you, we saw that piece of seabed popping up. And this is a map view of where you would expect areas where the seafloor would move up versus areas where, this, where the coastline may subside. So in this plot, areas that go up during an earthquake are shown in red, and areas that will subside or sink down are shown in blue. And notice that the areas that subside sort of hug right along the coastline. Now, this cycle of the coastline dropping down is actually preserved in lots of different sites in southwest Washington especially. And this is a picture of uh, one of the most famous sites and that's called the Copalis River Ghost Forest. And what you're seeing here are the remains of a forest of red cedar and Douglas fir that used to be higher up and then they dropped down suddenly during the 1700 earthquake. And now these trees all died as a result because they get tide water over them regularly. Well, when the tides are at their highest, they're completely covering this marsh that you can see here. And what this looks like in terms of the geologic record is something like this. So this is a different site, not too far away, where you can see dark brown forest soil at the bottom. And then on top of that is gray and also oxidizing orange intertidal mud. So this is deposits that form as the tides go in and out over time. And that goes all the way to the surface. But what's also interesting here is that you can see a tsunami deposit. And there are different layers of sand here and those are thought to represent individual waves in a tsunami event. And this is from the last big Cascadia event in 1700. Now, if you look at evidence from on land and also evidence from offshore, you can put together a very nice long timeline of Cascadia earthquakes. This is showing the last 10,000 years of Cascadia earthquakes. And the taller bars are larger magnitude earthquakes like magnitude 9. And then this sh these shorter ones are magnitude 8, which are still very large earthquakes. Now, um, there are only seven earthquakes, Cascadia earthquakes, in the last 3,500 years in Washington, um, just based on the land records. but if you can look at the sediments offshore in the deep ocean canyons, you can actually see deposits from great earthquake events, and these are called turbidites. And combining those two uh, pieces of evidence, that's how you can come up with this very nice long timeline, which tells us we've had about 23 great earthquakes in Cascadia over the last, last 10,000 years. And this is really important for understanding what our future hazards may be. You might wonder what a Cascadia tsunami will do as it moves inland into the Puget Sound area. And uh, Karina Allen will be talking about that more just after me, but I wanted to show you sort of a snapshot of maximum wave heights from a modeled Cascadia earthquake tsunami offshore. And uh, the city of Seattle is right here, and Tacoma, and Olympia. And what this is showing is that 
the tsunami is not going to be the same height everywhere but in some places it will be a significant event and aside from wave heights we also have to be concerned with dangerous currents which will also be discussed more later the next source i wanted to talk about are shallow faults places where they cross the seafloor they are able to generate tsunamis as well now we've got lots of shallow faults crisscrossing washington state and after studying many different faults uh, we've got kind of a group um, a group likelihood for all of them put together and that is 15 percent chance of a magnitude 6.5 or larger earthquake in the next 50 years and these have recurrence times of in the hundreds to thousands of years depending on which fault you are looking at um, an example of one of these faults making a tsunami um, is shown here on this map this is the seattle fault zone and this is how long ago the last event on that fault was and there you can see other faults and and uh, ages plotted here and these are uh, recent the most recent earthquakes on some of these faults and these uh, recent that's geologically speaking recent and i've circled ones uh, that we know or or almost completely certain um, also generated tsunamis so seattle fault did and also interestingly um, this lake creek boundary creek fault which runs through lake crescent also generated a tsunami about 1300 years ago so if you feel a large earthquake it's not just the marine coast you need to be worried about you need to be away from any large bodies of water Now, Seattle Fault crosses through Puget Sound and cuts through the southern end of Bainbridge Island. And during that last earthquake 1,100 years ago, there was 8 meters, or about 26 feet, of uplift. And that happened from the southern end of Bainbridge Island, which we can see here. And this flat green area that's now a golf course used to be down beneath the waves. And this is what we call a wave cut platform. And that was lifted suddenly during that earthquake. And that uplift also occurred underwater in Puget Sound and generated a tsunami that headed to the north and left geologic evidence in a few places. And one of those, um, the, where, where the best evidence and the largest or thickest tsunami deposit is, is on the southern end of Whidbey Island at Cultus Bay. And you can see this arrow is pointing at the sand layer left behind by the tsunami. But we know we also have lots of other faults, and we don't know exactly uh, how to characterize almost three-fourths of them. Uh, this map is showing everything that's been active in the Quaternary period, which is um, a little more than uh, two million years ago, or about two million years ago. Um, but so for some of these faults, we know that they've been active, but we don't necessarily know uh, when the last earthquake was and how frequently they experience earthquakes. So there's still a lot to figure out. The next source I'd like to talk about are deep earthquakes. And these are earthquakes that occur it, within the Juan de Fuca plate as it deforms because it's being shoved down um, beneath the North America plate. And these are our most frequent earthquake source, and we know that we've got about an 84% chance of having a magnitude 6.5 or larger earthquake in the next 50 years. These earthquakes recur on average between every 30 and 50 years, and the last large earthquake of this type that we had in um, Puget Sound in Washington was in 2001, the Nisqually earthquake. Now these types of earthquakes can't generate a tsunami directly like what we saw in the video, but what they can do is they can trigger landslides. These landslides can either occur completely underwater or they can involve uh, landsliding into water which displaces water. This map is showing uh, 
plot of orange dots that are showing places where there's evidence of some submarine landsliding. And the black dots are places where we know that that landsliding made tsunamis. One of these is the Tacoma Narrows, three days after a deep, a deep magnitude 7.1 earthquake, uh, this hillside collapsed and generated a tsunami that was about two and a half meters or eight feet high. And these are some houses here um, to give you an idea of the scale here. Another example is in 1894, a submarine landslide that destroyed the docks and caused two fatalities in Commencement Bay. This was not triggered by an earthquake. So these types of events can happen uh, with or without earthquakes. And this is what we believe is the most frequent source of uh, tsunamis here in Washington. We also know that we receive tsunamis from other places. And this animation is showing waves propagating from Alaska. And they reach the coast of Washington um, in just under four hours. We need to be very concerned about uh, these types, um, these types of tsunamis as well, because um, they happen so frequently. This map is showing about the last hundred years or so of large Alaskan earthquakes. Um, this map is showing areas of rupture um, as well as the magnitude and the year that that earthquake occurred. And uh, what's notable is that since the year 1788, there's been 82 observed tsunamis in Alaska, and there's probably others that weren't observed or recorded in any way. This is showing uh, distribution of tsunami deposits from uh, publications. Each one of these dots represents a, a publication that describes tsunami deposits. And um, they, the ones along the coast, on the, on the outer coast, the Pacific coast, are uh, very likely from Cascadia, but there's also a whole bunch that are inland. And um, sorting out where they came from is, is some of the work that I'm involved in. Now, one place where there are a lot of tsunami deposits is in Discovery Bay. And Discovery Bay is off of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and it's between about Port Townsend and Squim. And you can see this tidal marsh here, which we're going to uh, fly down into. And here's what the tidal marsh looks like. And the sediments here preserve a pretty remarkable record of past tsunamis in Washington. Nearby where this photo is taken, uh, I dug this pit. And in this pit, you can see four different tsunami deposits, which are these lighter layers here. And uh, this stick here is a meter long or about three feet long. And these have the ages I'm showing here. This youngest one is likely from the 1700 earthquake. And one of these two is likely from the Cascadia earthquake that preceded the one in 1700. This one here, it's not completely clear what the source of it is. And there's also five additional tsunami deposits below. So some of the work that I've been trying to do is aligning these with sources. There are more deposits here than there are Cascadia earthquakes in the same time frame. So we know that some of these other sources I talked about are almost certainly uh, represented in the geological record here. And with that, I will end and say thank you. Hello, my name is Karina Allen. I'm the Chief Hazards Geologist at the Washington Geological Survey, Department of Natural Resources. I'm going to be talking to you today about tsunami hazards in Washington, what the impacts may be for our coastlines and our communities. Carrie talked about Washington geological history and the geologic evidence for past tsunamis and earthquakes in our state. Another way that we learn about tsunami hazards is from experience. 
The two most recent and devastating tsunami events in recent memory are the 2011 Japan earthquake and tsunami and the 2004 Sumatra earthquake and tsunami. These events killed thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and caused millions and billions of dollars of economic loss in the communities that were impacted. These events are a devastating reminder of the potential for earthquakes and tsunamis that can happen on our coastline. Tsunamis are caused primarily by three ways, earthquakes, landslides, and volcanic eruptions. These are all possible in Washington state and have all happened in our past. Today, I'm gonna to be primarily focusing on earthquake sourced tsunamis. Tsunamis involve multiple waves. The first tsunami wave may not be the biggest in the series. In fact, in the Puget Sound, oftentimes the second, third, or fourth tsunami wave is the largest because of our complicated coastline and the way that the waves refract and bounce off of the islands and small, narrow passages. Tsunami waves are huge in width, length, and depth. The tsunami may not cease for hours to days. Tsunamis create power, powerful currents that cause damage and carry large hidden objects within them. You cannot swim or even surf through a tsunami. Tsunamis cannot be predicted. We know what types of earthquakes can cause them, but not when the earthquakes will happen. Tsunami impacts for Washington coastline have varying degrees of impact depending on the bathymetry or the shape of the ocean floor beneath the water and the topography on land, whether it's a steep bluff or coastline or a low lying river valley. In addition to that, the tsunami waves can be dampened by vegetation or other aspects of the built environment. In addition to the main earthquake which can cause the tsunami, these large earthquakes are also commonly followed by hundreds of aftershocks. This image on the right shows each of these beach balls is an example of one earthquake that happened during the 2011 Japan earthquake sequence. This largest event here is the magnitude 9.1 earthquake. You can see here that in the days leading up to the event, there were smaller earthquakes, and we call these foreshocks. Then the main earthquake happened, and in the following 10 days, each of these dots represents an earthquake that happened or an aftershock. In this table, I'm showing large earthquakes in our history and the number of magnitude six or greater aftershocks that happen. This is important because these aftershocks could potentially also cause tsunamis, but also for the first responders and the people who live in these communities to know that there will be following earthquakes after the large event. The main earthquake that is talked about for tsunami hazards in Washington and Carrie talked about this as well, is the Cascadia subduction zone. It's about 700 miles long off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and California, and it goes all the way up into Canada. It breaks about every 500 years on average, and the last great rupture was in 1700. That means there's about a 10 to 15 percent chance that we'll have one of these big earthquakes in the next 50 years. This earthquake will be felt region-wide, and the shaking will last three to six minutes. This is very important to understand because when I'm going to be showing you the tsunami modeling and the estimated wave arrival times for specific locations, we reference that to the start of the earthquake. And so if you think about the earthquake initiating and then the earthquake shaking lasting for up to six minutes, in some locations on the shore, the wave will arrive um, within 15 minutes. So that's only 10 minutes after the ground stops shaking. In order to do tsunami modeling, we have to figure out what the earthquake looks like. And scientists do this based on our known record of past earthquakes um, from geologic evidence and offshore evidence of turbidites, as Carrie talked about in the last presentation. There's been a great paper done by Rob Witter and others in 2011, who looks at the number of known earthquakes that have happened in the past 10,000 years and about how big they were. So, he, he categorized them by t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. And this is the magnitude over here. They're all very large earthquakes. Even the small earthquake is a magnitude 8.7. For our purposes in Washington state, we use the large earthquake or the L1 event. And this is a magnitude nine earthquake that ruptures the entire length of the Cascadia subduction zone. We also do tsunami modeling from crustal faults. 
the main one that we look at is the Seattle Fault. This is a complicated fault strand that trends east-west across the Seattle and Bainbridge Island area. And there are numerous strands of this fault. I'm going to take a zoom in, zoomed in look here at Bainbridge Island at one of the most famously studied strands called the Tojam Hill Fault Strand. This is the aerial imagery of Bainbridge Island and if we strip off the trees using a technology called LIDAR or light detection and ranging, we're able to see this fault strand screaming across Bainbridge Island. And in the last great rupture of the Seattle Fault earthquake, this is when this fault line broke Bainbridge Island and uplifted this point, as Carrie talked about in her presentation. We use a simplified Seattle fault trace for our modeling to understand what this potential tsunami impacts could be from the Seattle fault. All of Washington coastline is susceptible to tsunamis. Interestingly, some of the most notable tsunamis in our history and the recorded record have happened by landslides, both within the Puget Sound and within lakes across the state. Each of these stars represents a notable tsunami caused by a landslide in our state in the last 100 to 200 years. Now I'm gonna start transitioning and talking to you about our tsunami modeling and what that means for coastal communities. We use the tsunami model that Carrie talked about and showed in her slide, where we simulate uplift offshore and earthquake subsidence or depression in the land during the earthquake onshore. And then we allow the wave to propagate into the entire ocean um, column from the Cascadia subduction zone all the way to the outer coast through the Strait of Juan de Fuca and into the Puget Sound to understand what the tsunami inundation will look like in our coastal communities. This image on the right is a picture of the Cape Disappointment Iwako area along the southern end of the Long Beach Peninsula, just overlaying what the tsunami inundation would look like on today's topography. Tsunami modeling can help us estimate wave arrival times, tsunami wave amplitude, so the height of the wave offshore, tsunami inundation, the height of the water over the previously dry land, tsunami run-up, which is the distance the tsunami wave will travel inland, the duration of the tsunami wave action, and tsunami current velocity. This graphic shows the difference between tsunami amplitude, which is the height of the water out in the open ocean, versus inundation depth, which is the height of the water over the previously dry land or beach. And then run-up or inundation extent is the distance the tsunami wave will travel over the previously dry land. In order to do tsunami modeling, we have to make a few assumptions. The first one is that we simplify the fault model, so either the Cascadia subduction zone or the Seattle fault. We don't know what the next earthquake will look like. It may have very complicated slip, meaning it could break in, in the north or it could start breaking in the south, and it could have more displacement in certain areas than others. And so we're not sure what that will look like, and so we take a conservative approach and we, and we have uniform slip over the entire fault length, and we simulate an earthquake over the entire fault length as well. We reference our results to mean high water. What this means that if when the next earthquake happens and it arrives on low tide or a king tide, the waves might be higher or lower than what we modeled in our simulation. We base our modeling on the best available topography and bathymetry data. And Unfortunately, the waves are not able to interact with the buildings, the vegetation, or the built environment that we have today. We use what's called a bare earth model. So we strip off the existing vegetation topography, excuse me, the existing vegetation and buildings and let the tsunami wave travel over the bare earth. Ideally, we would be able to model this with all of those things in place, but we just don't have the computer power or the modeling um, infrastructure at this time, but we're hoping to get there. And lastly, we don't account for seismically induced landslides. This means that our models don't account for landslides that might cause secondary tsunamis during these events. All right, enough of that. Now I'm going to show you a cool tsunami wave simulation from a magnitude 9.0 Cascadia earthquake scenario, or the L1 event, on the Cascadia subduction zone. 
This simulation is going to show wave amplitudes, so the wave peaks and the wave troughs from this magnitude 9.0 earthquake. As the video plays, you will see wave amplitude on the left, with the 10 feet or higher being the warm colors and 10 feet or lower being the cool colors. And you're going to see the time since the earthquake initiated on the bottom left. This is a disclaimer saying that our model cuts off on Vancouver Island, so don't use this simulation to estimate wave arrival times for Canada. For those of you not familiar with Washington, here we are in between Canada and Oregon on the Washington Peninsula. We're simulating a magnitude 9 earthquake now, and this is the wave traveling towards the outer coast hitting in about 15-20 minutes. You can see the wave front propagating through the Strait of Juan de Fuca now. There's a leading trough here followed by a crest. The leading wave front will split and go north into the San Juan Islands, Bellingham, and Anacortes, and then also at the same time go south into the Hood Canal, hitting Seattle at about two and a half hours, Tacoma after that, and then you'll see the waves traveling and dissipating as they reach the southern Puget Sound, but making it all the way down to Olympia. Here we are three and a half hours after the earthquake started, and you can see there's still significant waves happening along the outer coast and in some of these narrow inlets and passageways. You, this is Discovery Bay where Carrie talked about tsunami deposits um, during her presentation. These narrow bays and inlets are kind of like a tsunami magnet because they capture the waves and they're able to record these tsunami deposits quite well. We're also able to study and simulate tsunami current velocity. This is a simulation, again, for a magnitude 9.0 Cascadia earthquake, but this time I'm going to be showing currents. That's the speed at which the water travels, and we use knots and a knot is about 1.15 miles per hour. The darker purple colors represent higher speeds and the more yellow or peach colors represent lower speeds. The bottom left, excuse me, the bottom right shows time since the earthquake initiated. Here we are in the southern San Juan Islands. And unfortunately, we don't have high resolution current velocity data for the whole state. So we're gonna have to zoom in after the earthquake starts to the Southern San Juan Islands and watch the tsunami approach the area. Here we are about 30 minutes after the earthquake starts and the tsunami is beginning to approach the area. You can see that there's an increase in current velocity as the first tsunami wave arrives. The narrow waterways between the islands and within these um, these bays and harbors is where you'll notice the current speeds are the strongest. You can see whirlpools and eddies develop and unfortunately they seem to follow the ferry lines um, and this is also where you see lots of recreational boaters because these islands are beautiful to visit. In both this simulation and the last that I showed, this is sped up about 300 times so that you can understand what this looks like over a period of hours. Now I'm going to show you some tsunami inundation and approximate wave arri arrival times for these select locations. So we have a variety of locations along the outer coast, some along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, up into Bellingham, along Whidbey Island, Everett, um, in Seattle at the Great Wheel, Port of Tacoma, Olympia, and in Belfair. These inundation and wave arrival times are in reference to the start of the earthquake, as um, I mentioned in a previous slide. The estimated inundation, inundation depths are for the select locations that I chose, but the inundation may continue much farther inland than the specific location that I'll show in the next table. These are scenario bait based based on this magnitude 9.0 Cascadia earthquake. The next earthquake may create bigger or smaller, smaller tsunami waves than the ones that I will show you here. There are publications available with the information um, for many of these locations and for the others in the Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia areas, we're going to be releasing a publication that has details about this in early 2021. So I'm not going to read each of these to you, but what I'll, what I'll show you is that for areas on the outer coast, Long Beach, La Push, Ocean Shores, Ho, Tohola, and Nia Bay, the first 
Cascadia subduction zone wave arrives in about 15 to 20 minutes. And the approximate inundation depths range from about 15 feet to over 60 feet in one location, with the average being about 30 feet. For areas like Port Angeles and Port Townsend in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, it takes about an hour, hour and 40 minutes, and inundation depths are about 10 to 15 feet. In Whidbey Island and Everett and um, the northern part of the Puget Sound, the wave arrives in about two hours and inundation depths are lower in these locations at about two feet. Down in Seattle and um, Tacoma area, the wave arrives in about two and a half hours. And depending on where you are, um, the wave inundation depth is about two to 10 feet. And then down in Olympia, the first wave arrives in about four hours and 15 minutes. This is a good example of a location where the maximum wave is definitely not the first one because the maximum wave arrives in about 10 hours after the start of the earthquake and the inundation there is about two feet. For some of these locations in red, we have estimated inundation from a Seattle fault event. For these areas, um, Seattle in particular, the Seattle Fault earthquake will simulate a, will generate a tsunami which will arrive in the downtown Seattle waterfront within just minutes. And the inundation depth is expected to be quite severe at about 27 feet in the downtown waterfront area and about five feet in the port of Tacoma. We produce tsunami inundation maps like the one shown here to show wave arrival times, inundation maps, and these can be used for land use planning and mitigation. We also produce tsunami current velocity maps, such as the one shown here, which show how strong the currents will be for the select map areas. This is very useful if you're in the maritime community and you would like to know how strong the wave currents may be. We also work closely with communities to develop tsunami evacuation maps. The one shown here is for the Aberdeen, Hoquiam, and Cosmopolis area and shows the amount of time it will take to walk slowly out of the inundation area to high ground. The orange colors here are the different amount, are the different lengths of time it will take you to reach the high ground areas and the preferred routes to get there. In some cases, the time it takes to walk to safety is greater than the time for the wave to arrive. In those instances, you have to either run or in some severe cases, there's no evacuation option and vertical evacuation is necessary. These tools are very helpful for emergency managers and the public to understand what the evacuation routes are and what options are needed in order to provide safe refuge for communities. We have all this information on our geologic information portal. The link is shown here, but you can also just type in Washington Geology Portal into your browser and you should be able to find it. What I'm showing here is all of the different available tsunami products. We show the existing mapped hazard area. We have tsunami walk maps and evacuation routes, as well as the location of tsunami sirens. I mentioned before that we're coming up with new modeling and mapping that shows tsunami inundation for Cascadia and the Seattle Fault. This figure shows the extents of, that, of those models and the map plates that will be coming out in early 2021. Yesterday, we came out with a new tsunami hazards brochure. You can either copy this link or also just type in tsunami hazards in Washington state in your browser and you should be able to find it. It's full of great resources about what a tsunami is, tsunami hazards, knowing where to go and how to find alert information. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Please type your questions into the chat box or email, email them to me directly. Hello. I'm Maximilian Dixon. I am the Hazards and Outreach Program Supervisor here at Washington State Emergency Management Division. And also presenting is Samantha Borth. She is a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Seattle office. And today we're gonna to be talking to you about how to get alerted for tsunamis and what to do when a tsunami is on the way. So first to understand a difference between distant and local tsunamis. A distant tsunami, you're not gonna feel the earthquake. The first waves will arrive and greater than three hours from when the earthquake happened. Your warning uh, must be distributed either through an alert process uh, or through natural signs. There will be less inundation, there will be uh, less drastic currents in the water, 
and also less severe impacts to the coastline and maritime infrastructure. For a local event, uh, which is typically felt through an earthquake, this is your warning sign, uh, the wave arrival times will be less than three hours from when the earthquake happens. The earthquake, again, is your primary warning. Uh, there will be more inundation, potentially higher waves, uh, faster and more dangerous currents, and also significantly higher impacts along the coastline and to maritime infrastructure. So for an example, as a distant source tsunami threat, uh, our greatest risk really is from Alaska. They have a lot of events, as you may have seen before, uh, many events uh, in the last 200 years. But also, if you can see on the left here, uh, the higher the red bar is, the higher potential there is for the wave heights uh, to hit Washington coastline. And you can see on the right side, you can see the uh, darker color. Uh, it sig signifies uh, more intense uh, currents and potentially higher wave energy that's going to be hitting the Washington state. And then you can see that it kind of fans out uh, and you have less intense waves as you go into other areas on the Pacific Ocean. So here again, from Alaska event, which is our worst case uh, distant source event for Washington state, the waves could arrive in less than four hours. It's important to know the natural tsunami warning signs. Uh, so obviously, if you feel strong shaking, uh, if you're near the coast, you know, obviously you want to drop cover and hold on and get to high ground. That shaking is your warning. Also, if you happen to be along the shoreline and you see a sudden rise, i.e. a wall of water coming towards you, or a rapid, uh, the rapid receding of the ocean, then like, you know, fish is flopping on the ground, right? So don't get the fish. Uh, these are signs that a tsunami is coming your way. Also, if you hear a loud, unusual roar, like a jet plane or a train coming from the ocean, uh, these are all signs of a potential tsunami. So you want to get to high ground or inland as quickly as possible. It's important to understand the different tsunami alerts. We will go over these a few times during these presentations, but it's really important for you to understand the differences between these. So we'll start with an information statement. Uh, that's in the green color. Essentially, this is letting people know, hey, there was a, an earthquake out in the ocean floor or somewhere that people are concerned about a potential tsunami. It'll tell you that, hey, there's really no expected impact, uh, no need to worry. Now, it's just letting people know that, yes, there was an event, here's where the earthquake was, but no need to worry about a tsunami. For a watch, that's a yellow, essentially, there could be a tsunami. It's possible but they don't have enough information yet to verify whether a tsunami is on the way or not. But this is a really important step to take for the watch is to get prepared. Uh, listen to and stay tuned to your no weather radio stations, uh, to local TV or radio, uh, and go on tsunami.gov. Get your go bag ready, be ready to evacuate if that becomes necessary. For an advisory, orange level, this essentially tells you that a tsunami is on the way. Uh, the wave is anywhere from one to three feet high, uh, and you're gonna have strong and dangerous currents. Uh, you're gonna have some waves that impact the shoreline. So essentially stay out of the water and stay away from the shore. For the warning, that's your highest and most dangerous alert level. That's in red. That means that a tsunami is on the way. It's dangerous, it's imminent, the waves are gonna be higher than three feet. It's gonna be powerful flooding currents, and this is extreme danger, which means you need to get to high ground and inland immediately. All right, so as part of the National Weather Service, we have two National Tsunami Warning Centers. The first one is the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center located in Honolulu, Hawaii. And the second one is the National Tsunami Warning Center located in Palmer, Alaska. Uh, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center is in charge of the international, it's basically the international warning center for 26 member countries, uh, including Hawaii. And the National Tsunami Warning Center uh, in Alaska will issue all the tsunami products for North America. So Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. So running through the process of issuing a tsunami warning. Um, so first off, an earthquake is going to occur. 
uh, that is going to be detected by the seismic sensors and that will alert the tsunami warning centers. Uh, the earthquake will then initially be located and sized automatically. Information will then be compared to the historical database and then the tsunami warning or alert messages will be disseminated within, within minutes. And so an important thing to note is those first five steps of this process are going to happen anywhere from three to five minutes. So then products or steps six and seven are going to be updated as necessary. So six, you're going to monitor, so the tsunami warning center is going to monitor the tide gauges and the dark buoys to confirm whether a wave was generated. And if no wave was recorded on any of the tide gauges, the warning is then going to be canceled. So I'm going to run through the schematic of how uh, of the process of how a tsunami alert or warning is disseminated. Um, so as mentioned uh, previously, so the first thing that's going to happen is the earthquake. So the seismometer is going to pick up on that and that is going to get sent via satellite to the tsunami warning center. And that's where uh, this information is going to get processed that we saw on the previous slides, steps one through five. Um, and then within minutes, that's going to get sent via satellite to the National Weather Service, the State Emergency Operations Center, and the U.S. Coast Guard. So if that is a tsunami warning, that is automatically going to get generated uh, via the Via the, via the WIA, and that's going to be the wireless emergency alert. Um, the state EOC will then send that to the emergency alert system um, and to the local EOC, who will then activate the sirens. The National Weather Center is then, the National Weather Service is then going to send that out to the National uh, Weather Service, uh, the local office. And that local office, like we are here in NWS Seattle, we are then going to put that on the NOAA weather radio or the emergency alert system. And, and. Um, and lastly, the Coast Guard is also going to get this information and they are going to disseminate that further to mariners out on the coast. So tsunami alert dissemination. Uh, tsunami alerts occur for any type of tsunami event. These are most important during distant source events because the earthquake is not going to be your natural first warning um, because you're not going to feel it. Uh, we do typically stress to make sure that you have more than one way to receive a warning um, and to know how to receive these warnings and make sure that you're informed. So the first alerting system, the NOAA weather radio, is basically a, a warning alarm feature uh, that kind of acts just like a fire alarm. So they are set to go off and to interrupt. Uh, they are not just for tsunami alerts. They are also, um, they are also going to alert for winter storms, high winds, um, for, for major uh, weather events, such as a tornado warning. Uh, we have 16 stations here in Washington and you need to make sure that you program your radio to your area. And this is kind of a nice feature, but the new models are programmed to only sound for a warning. So you're not going to have uh, multiple weather updates alert in the middle of the night, you're just going to, to have the important warnings where you have to take action or stay, stay informed. Uh, the emergency alert system or the EAS was originally designed for the president to address the nation in times of a disaster. Uh, these get activated for life threatening weather, weather events or natural hazards. Um, this is also used by the law enforcement, so for Amber Alerts. Um, so if you hear that steady EAS tone or see the, the scrolling message um, on your TV when you're watching TV for a tsunami watch or a warning, um, this is basically telling you that you need to take action or you really need to pay attention. And the wireless emergency alert system, so that's the WIA. Um, this is used only when a, when a tsunami warning is issued. So you will receive this message once uh, and it will be one message. So there are a few, few caveats. Um, so the participation in WIA by wireless carriers is widespread, but it is, is only voluntary. So you're gonna wanna make sure to check with your wireless carriers. Um, and then even if you have a WIA enabled device, you may not receive a WIA if your device is roaming or if you're in a service area where the provider is not offering a WIA. Um, in addition, so if there's any tsunami event that is going to occur um, along the Washington coast, 
the media is also going to receive these National Tsunami Warning Center alerts and they're going to start broadcasting them. So you're going to notice that they're going to interrupt your regularly scheduled programs um, and they're going to, to keep you updated on the latest information. So the example on the right is just a, a picture or graphics for what um, the Como News here in Seattle would do. So they would uh, make sure that they're keeping the public updated. And so even when they get local insight and imagery, um, they're going to start showing, showing people the hazards of what's happening uh, around the region. Uh, Tsunami.gov. So this is a really great website. It will visually display where earthquakes occur um, and their alert levels. So if you go, if you go to the site, you'll, you'll see this map pop up. Um, and what you're going to want to look for is for any messages for the U.S. West Coast, uh, British Columbia, or Alaska. And so right under that map, uh, it's going to it's going to list the last 40 messages um, right underneath there. And that's the newest message is going to pop up on the top. So you can click that and view any information, any alert that was sent with that. Um, and in addition to that, it has a great variety of information that you can gather from the site. Um, whether that's exercises or anything for outreach activities or educational resources um, or just if you're interested in the tsunami program in general and how it works. Um, there are two caveats though. This will not be useful for um, an intercoast tsunami event. So if we have an earthquake along the Cascadia subduction zone um, and it tends to have a history of crashing during big events. But this is one of the reasons why we want to stress that it's good to have multiple ways to receive a warning. And another way that you can stay informed, so you can send a text message um, to 40404. And with the following, with the following text, follow NWS, and that's a space, NTWC. Um, so this doesn't always work, but if it does work, it should send you a text message anytime the Tsunami Warning Center sends out an alert. Um, what you can do otherwise is you can follow the Tsunami Warning Center on Twitter. If you have a Twitter, they're always posting updates whenever there's an alert out. Um, or on Facebook, they will share those updates there as well. Um, you can also subscribe to an email service uh, via UNESCO forward slash IOC. So if you, if you want to subscribe, you can send your information to the email address listed below. Um, and they will be able to alert you anytime there's a tsunami um, alert out. So in addition to that, the NWS Seattle also will uh, send out alerts on Twitter and on Facebook, um, and Portland will as well. And make sure that you, you're following Washington EMD. We also have the All Hazard Alert Broadcast Siren System. This is an outdoor tsunami warning system. Again, repeat, this is for outdoors. So if you are indoors, you will not hear these sirens. You will only hear them out near the beach or wherever they are near the coastline. These are operated by the State Alert and Warning Center, which will activate these sirens upon receipt of an official Tsunami Warning Center from the National Tsunami Warning Center. Uh, and also, the locals can activate these sirens at any time. We test these monthly, and you will hear the Westminster chimes. Uh, this is the first Monday of every month. We also set off the warning, uh, which is a whale tone followed by a verbal warning in English and Spanish. We set that off for the Great Shakeout, which is the third Thursday of every October. So if you hear the tsunami warning, the whale tone, and the message in English and Spanish to get to high ground, then get to high ground immediately. So these are placed all over the coastline, Washington State. We currently have 76 that are installed that are active right now. We are also going to be installing 16 new sirens uh, over the next year because we got state funding to do this uh, to be able to fill the gaps. We do have an issue though for alerting for the intercoast, uh, Puget Sound and Salish Sea. Currently the National Weather Service does not have forecasting or later alerting capabilities for the intercoast uh, for a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, the big one and or a distant tsunami, i.e. from Alaska or somewhere else in the Pacific Ocean. So what this means is that no, no weather radio broadcasts, emergency alert system broadcasts, 
or information on tsunami.gov uh, or forecasted wave arrival times uh, will be uh, you know, either broadcast or available on tsunami.gov for intercoast locations. But Washington Emergency Management Division will be sending out a wireless emergency alert message, tsunami warning to the intercoast. And you can see for the intercoast, it's the red polygon on the right. So tsunami alerts. So you have seen this before, but I wanna go over it again. So again, you have four different alert levels. You've got green information statement, no action needed. You've got yellow, which is a watch. Essentially, there could be a tsunami. There's not an information yet to verify whether a tsunami is on the way, but get your go bag, stay tuned for more information, get ready to evacuate. You have orange advisory. There is a tsunami on the way. It's a one to three foot wave. You're gonna have strong currents and dangerous waves. Essentially, stay out of the water, stay away from the shore. The red warning, this means that a dangerous tsunami is on the way, wave heights three feet or higher, powerful currents, very, very dangerous, immediately get to high ground or inland. So now I'm gonna go through an example of a tsunami alert. So essentially, if you sign up to the Twitter text, uh, or if you get this and see this in one of the various uh, ways to get alerts, uh, it will look like this. So you, important information here, you've got, this identifies the number in the series. Is this the first alert message, the second, the third, whatnot? So when you're looking at it, you can see uh, you know, which, which one it is. And also it tells you the date, but remember this is in Alaska time, right? So calculate that. Also, you'll have major updates or changes to previous alerts. So essentially here you can see a tsunami warning is now in effect, the tsunami watch is now in effect. Now, if you remember, the National Warning Center will cover multiple countries, i.e. Canada, United States, as in North America, as well as multiple states. So there may be some areas where there's a warning, some areas where there's a watch. So this is why it tells you uh, the different ones at the top. For instance, tsunami warning is now in effect for British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, et cetera. So you will see very clearly that this is where a warning has been issued. And then this is where a watch has been issued, i.e. Washington State, you can see there down below. So that will tell you where a warning has been issued and where a watch has been issued or an advisory, uh, if there's an advisory. Now looking a little bit more closely, uh, so you've got your preliminary earthquake parameters here. So it tells you, hey, magnitude 8.0, uh, you know, what time it was. Now you can see Pacific Standard Time. Uh, you can see, you know, where the earthquake was, how deep it was, location, whatnot. So this gives you the details on the event. And we go here. So this, we go into forecasted arrival time for the first wave. This is important to understand that they're still monitoring tide gauges and dart buoys, but they don't know whether a tsunami has been generated yet or not. This is really early in the event. Obviously, this is the first alert, so it would have gone out within uh, three to five minutes after the shaking started. So you can see down here in Washington State, uh, these are the forecasted sites. So we've got Nia Bay, Long Beach, Mo Cliffs, Westport, Port Angeles, Port Townsend. So this tells you that if a tsunami is on the way, this is the forecasted time for when that first wave is gonna hit. Now you can see this is blown up a little bit more closely. So you can see Nia Bay gets hit first uh, in this you know, example, right? Uh, and you can see then where in the expected wave arrival times for the different areas as it's traveling uh, down the, the strait and the outer coast of, of uh, Washington. Okay, this is also now, uh, we've gotten further into the event and they've got enough information uh, from the dart buoys and the tide gauges. And you can see here forecasted max tsunami heights. Uh, so that will say, let's say for instance, Long Beach, it's the second one down. 4.4 feet plus or minus 1.5 feet. Uh, so this kind of gives you the range of what that maximum tsunami height uh, would be. Also the forecasted tsunami duration. So this is uh, the time where you're gonna have waves going back and forth. Uh, and so here you can see the, the range and time where it's gonna be dangerous. Uh, you know, and of course, stay out of the tsunami inundation zone until you're told by local emergency managers that it's okay to go back to the zone. 
And then if there's observed tsunami heights, which we don't have on this example, uh, but you'll see uh, they will start populating uh, what those observed heights are if, if we have ones that are observed. Okay, so for local tsunamis, I wanna emphasize this. The shaking is your warning, right? For local tsunamis, the shaking is your warning. So the first waves could arrive within seconds to minutes. You know, for the outer coast here, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, you know, you're talking 15 to 20 minutes for the outer coast, right? Not a lot of time. Um, so for local tsunami sources, you've got the Cascadia subduction zone fault, the big one, Seattle fault, Tacoma fault, South Whidbey Island fault, Devil's Mountain fault. So those faults are along Puget Sound, uh, crisscross east-west Puget Sound, uh, as well as the Salish Sea, um, and the Cascadia is out on the coast. So these are really the faults that we know of that could potentially cause tsunamis, uh, the ones we're really worried about. All right, so the shaking has happened, it's a local event. First, you need to survive the earthquake, okay? Drop cover and hold on and protect yourself. I don't want you to get injured, break your leg, hit your head, so you actually, so then you can't get to high ground. Uh, please also go to shakeout.org slash Washington. This is the great shakeout I mentioned. It's a great way to practice every year. So go sign up and register for this year. Thank you. Also, something important, do not try to run. Most injuries during an earthquake happen, either people falling while they're trying to move during the shaking or being struck by falling objects. So an example, Christchurch. You'll notice the unreinforced masonry building in the top right. So the building did not collapse, but you can see how dangerous it is near the building where people would have either run out of the building or been running around. Very dangerous, so do not run. Also, here's an example in Mexico City, 1985. This is a school. You can see that the it's pancaked, right? The only thing keeping the floors from completely pancaking together are these school desks. So there are, are people, if they had dropped cover and held on underneath the desks, they would have survived. So it could save your life. And this is a little video, it's gonna walk you through the process. The Pacific Northwest is earthquake country. We have thousands of earthquakes every year, but most of them aren't even felt. Earthquakes can't be predicted, but an earthquake early warning system called ShakeAlert is coming soon. It's an alert that could give you seconds to minutes of warning before damaging shaking reaches you so that you can take protective actions. You can survive an earthquake. Here's how. When you receive a ShakeAlert, take action to protect yourself. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to your hands and knees. This prevents you from falling, but still allows you to move to a safer area if necessary. Cover your head and neck. If possible, take cover under a sturdy piece of furniture, like a table or desk. Hold on to your cover and remain in this position until the shaking stops. If there is no shelter nearby, get down away from windows or anything that might fall on you and protect your head and neck with your arms. If you are near the coast, a tsunami may be coming. As soon as you feel it's safe to move, immediately grab your go bag and follow evacuation routes to high ground or inland. To avoid traffic jams and other hazards, go by foot. Do not drive. Be aware of dangerous obstacles that could be on your evacuation route, such as downed power lines and trees, landslides, and debris. Remember, when you receive a shake alert, protect yourself. Drop, cover, and hold on. Evaluate your surroundings, then get somewhere safe and tune in to local media for more information. And here's a video from the Alaska earthquake a couple years ago. Look how quick that was. Kids are great. All right, so remember, drop cover and hold on, protect yourself as soon as you can, get to high ground. And that tsunami is coming in a series of waves. The first wave is often not the highest wave, so don't go back to the beach, don't go back down into the water and take pictures. Get off the beach, stay away from the shoreline, get to high ground and stay there until it's safe. Hello, I'm Jacob Whitcraft. Uh, I'm the Tsunami Program Coordinator for the Washington Emergency Management Division with the focus on the intercoast and maritime. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the maritime hazards of tsunamis. Um, I'm gonna start here with talking about maritime impacts from one specific tsunami, Tohoku, in 2011. So in Japan, that was a local event, and for their maritime industry, that was they lost 28,000 ships, 
319 ports were destroyed and it cost their economy about 300, $3.9 billion a day. In California, the same event impacted their coast as a distant event and it caused over $100 million in damage to over 24 harbors. And some of those harbors were closed for over a year and some still haven't recovered yet. Now in Washington, we have a very robust maritime economy and we actually have 31 different ports that are at risk of tsunami damage, including the ports of Seattle and Tacoma, which together, they are the fourth largest container gateway in the entire United States. We also have the largest ferry system in the United States. We have seven Coast Guard stations, four Navy bases, over 700 fishing and seafood processing operations, 400 private marinas, and it's a $37 billion industry for our state. So some of the tsunami hazards for harbors and boaters are strong and unpredictable currents, sudden water level fluctuations where docks and boats can hit the bottom, they can overtop their piles, or they can, boats can actually be pushed right on top of docks. There's, it, tsunamis can create eddies and whirlpools, Tsunami bores and amplified waves can swamp boats and damage docks. They put a massive amount of debris in the water, and these dangerous conditions can last for 12 to 24 hours or more after the first wave arrival, which can impact boaters who choose to take their boats offshore. So what can you do if a distant tsunami strikes? If you're on the water, you need to move to a location that's at least 30 fathoms deep and you need to stay at least a half a mile away from the shorelines. Avoid any areas with potential for strong currents. And if there's a suitable location, if a suitable location isn't reachable in time, you is reachable in time, you should dock your vessel and evacuate to high ground. If you're on land or you're tied up to a dock, you should definitely just leave your vessel and evacuate to high ground, which means you should know your evacuation routes and know that many distant source tsunamis are small enough that you can safely leave your boat docked and that congestion in waterways and at boat ramps can be extremely dangerous. So what to do if a local tsunami strikes? If you're on the water, you need to stop whatever you're doing immediately. Free any bottom attachments, attempt, dock your vessel and evacuate to high ground if you're able to. If you're not, you need to head your vessel to at least beyond 100 fathoms. Be super aware of other vessels around you and try and avoid any areas for potential for dangerous currents. If you're on land, just evacuate immediately to high ground. You do not have time to save your vessel and you could die trying. So what can you do after a tsunami? If you're offshore on the water, you should check with the US Coast Guard for guidance before trying to return. And if you're onshore, you definitely need to check with your local authorities for guidance before you return to the inundation zone. Do not return to your local ports until you have firm guidance from the Coast Guard and your local authorities, because ports and marinas could sustain heavy damage and might not be safe for days, weeks, or even months. So what can you do? You should know your tsunami alert levels and have a NOAA weather radio on your boat. You should have enough fuel and emergency supplies on your vessel for at least three days at sea. And you should know the areas of dangerous currents to avoid and safe locations in open, open water. So one of the things we're trying to do here at EMD is develop a tsunami maritime response and mitigation strategy. Basically, this is just a tsunami response and mitigation strategy for maritime facilities specifically. It's designed for port or harbor scale decision making. And it differs a little bit from our existing tsunami response and mitigation plans, which focus on land-based response and mitigation. This actually focuses specifically on the maritime community and offers guidance for water-based response and mitigation activities. What's the goal of that? We're trying to develop this document to use as a template that any maritime facility can utilize. The strategy is a two-part document with the first part being general guidance that's appropriate for anyone in the maritime community. And part two is port specific response and mitigation strategies. This includes appendices with port specific data, 
response checklists, inspection forms, other things that can be beneficial to them. And eventually the goal is to develop a response and mitigation strategy for all major and at-risk ports in the state. Hi, my name is Alyssa Tapero, and I'm a Tsunami Program Coordinator with Washington Emergency Management Division. And today I'm going to be talking to you about tsunami preparedness. So when we think about tsunami preparedness, hopefully you're asking yourself questions about whether you're prepared. Questions like, how will I know a tsunami is coming? How will I get alerted? What are my evacuation routes? Do I have a family emergency plan? Do I have a go bag? How am I going to communicate with the people I love? Those are all very important things to have planned ahead so that when that emergency or disaster strikes, you can put that plan into action. So one thing that we definitely want to emphasize is plan to be on your own for a while after a major disaster, especially something like a Cascadia earthquake and tsunami. Um, a lot of our infrastructure may be damaged and it might take first responders a while to get to your area. And so it's especially important that you are planning for these disasters on both kind of a local family level and also on a community level, because that's who's going to be banding together during that time. It's very important to have supplies at your home and also anywhere where you spend a lot of time. Uh, we kind of have two different kinds of supplies that we talk about. We have at home, like shelter in place supplies. Uh, and then go bags. And so at your house, in order to shelter in place, like many of us are doing right now, uh, we want you to have at least two weeks worth of non-perishable food and water. And that's one gallon of water per person per day, which covers drinking, cooking, cleaning, anything like that. And if you can have more than that, if you can have three weeks or four weeks worth, it's great to have that on hand because you just never know. The other important thing that we want you to have and that you'll hear about a lot are go bags, which are basically bags that you're going to take with you for immediate evacuation, either to high ground or to a shelter or in some situation like that. And so it's important to have one for each member of your family. That includes kids, you know, elderly parents, pets, anyone that you want to be prepared for. And then it's also important to have one of those anywhere where you spend a lot of time. So at home, at work, at school, in your vehicle, it's important that way if there an emergency strikes and you're not home, you still have those supplies with you. So what do you put in your bag? It's really important to have water, food, anything that you're gonna need to survive for a few days. And obviously you're not going to wanna be carrying gallons of water with you in this bag because you're gonna be needing to move quickly. So having something like water purification tablets or a water for purification kit is very important. Great to have things like a fire starter, non-perishable food, a can opener, some things that people don't always think about. And something I like to emphasize is having important documents, both um, scanned copies and then also having them on a flash drive with you. That way, if you're stuck in a shelter and you weren't able to grab your purse or your wallet and you're missing some of that identification, you've got those on hand. Also very important to have essentials for everyone in your family. So pet food, if you've got pets, um, comfort items are especially good for kids and for people of all ages, because then if you are stuck in a shelter, you know, it, it can be very, very tough. And if you've got a teddy bear or a picture of your family or something that brings you joy, um, that can help that time move faster. So whatever it is that you need to survive for several days or even a little bit longer. It is also important to have sort of a mini go kit next to your bed. At, after nighttime earthquakes, the number one injury in emergency rooms is feet cut by broken glass or debris, people who are jumping out of bed and then trying to exit their, their buildings. So it's great to have a little bag or a duffel bag tied to your bed or under your bed that's got a spare pair of shoes, a flashlight with batteries, maybe a jacket in case you're running outside in a cold Washington winter, and then a pair of glasses or what you, whatever you might need in that moment to jump out. So great to have that just in case. It's also very important to have a plan for evacuations and to practice that plan. Evacuating will take longer than you think. So if you don't have that go bag packed, 
it's going to take precious minutes for you to gather all that stuff that you need and get it in one place. So having it already packed and stored in an easily accessible place like a front hall closet or something like that will buy you good time. It's also important not to waste time confirming alerts that you've received with secondary sources or with social media. So if you hear on your NOAA radio that there's a tsunami warning, don't then go you know, checking Twitter. Don't call your friends and family and see if they got this too. That is your warning and that's the time that you need to then be putting your plan into place. And absolutely important to practice, practice, practice your plan especially in disasters where we're waking up in the middle of the night or we've had a lot going on, a lot of times your brain's not going to be able to remember something quite as quickly as it normally would. So it's important that that plan is basically an instinct for you. Um, as you can see in the picture here, it's great to have community events where people walk their tsunami routes. That way you actually know, not just because you've looked on a map, but exactly which roads you're taking and where you need to go. There are also two house bills through Washington which require public schools to practice one earthquake drill per year and then one tsunami drill per year if they are in a mapped tsunami inundation zone. So that's a lot of schools on the coast are practicing both of those. And that's a great way for kids to understand where they need to go. And that's also a really good time to practice your family plan and figure out well, who are we calling and what are we gonna do. So very important to practice that. So I know we talked a little bit earlier about earthquakes and you know the shaking is your warning. So what if you could be alerted when an earthquake was occurring before the shaking reached you? So Shake Alert is coming to Washington State. The Shake Alert system detects damaging earthquakes as they occur and rapidly disseminates warning to end users. So. Um, the farther you are away, the more time that's going to buy you. And it may just be five seconds, it might be 30 seconds, but any time you have to know that that's coming and to drop cover and hold is very precious. So our goal is for the Shake Alert messages to be available to the public starting in 2021 via both WIA and then also mobile phone apps that you'll be able to download. The other great way to practice your plan is to register for the Great Washington Shakeout. The Great Shakeout is the largest earthquake drill in the world, and Washington State had 1.5 million participants in 2019. It's the highest number we've ever had. It's always the third Thursday in October, which this year will be 10.15 a.m. on October 15th, 2020, so 10.15 on 10.15. And this is something that everybody can participate in. So individuals, families, businesses, nonprofits, schools, local government, everybody is taking part. So you might take part at work and register there and also register your family and register your kids when they're doing it through the school. Very important that everybody's taking part in this. So please register at shakeout.org slash Washington and help us reach 2 million for this year. We also have a ShakeOut Youth video contest. Uh, it has two categories, middle school, so kids that are aged for grades six through eight, and then high school for kids who are aged nine through 12. It has cash prizes for the first and second place winners. And all they need to do is create a video that talks about what to do if there's an earthquake and that references ShakeOut. And you can see on our YouTube channel, EMD Prepare, the winners from previous years, and they are great. These videos are absolutely amazing. So definitely check those out once you're done. And then if you know someone who would be interested in taking part in this, definitely check out shakeout.org slash Washington or pass that on to them. So are we next? We could be, and that's why it's so important for you to take action today. We also have um, something that's going on right now, which is the coronavirus pandemic. So right now we're urging people stay home, stay healthy. That's gonna cut down on the number of people who are infected and help get us back to, back to our normal lives as quickly as possible. If you have any questions, you can check out coronavirus.wa.gov. You can also call the Washington Department of Health's hotline. That is 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily, and so any questions you have or concerns or if you're wanting to know how to help at the local level or higher, 
go ahead and check those out. So remember, you can survive if you get prepared. And here are some great resources for you.